my finest this evening. We're off to get some oysters. It's cold. This week we share with you our week in February exploring spectacular Fortescue Bay on the Tasman Peninsula. We do our bit to remove some of the gargantuan Whoa. feral species along the shoreline and develop a healthy appetite for the local bait fish. I got slippery fish everywhere. Yeah, it's the survey. Welcome to Free Range Sailing. Join us as we sail around Australia, visiting its wild places in our 30 foot, 50 year old sailing boat, Marul. Living off the land and sea while sailing a yacht that costs less than a new car, we show that it's possible to have big adventures with a seaworthy boat on a very modest budget. I'm going to get out of here. <laughs> With very little in the way of seafood in our fridge, we were very happy to welcome these mackerel on board at our new anchorage in Fortescue Bay. That's why you, you just throw that cloth on top of them. Oh, look at him tail hook. That's a beauty though. Give me a lot of chances to tangle line and get off. This is one of our little jack mackerel. Sometimes they get bigger, sometimes they get smaller. This is probably on the smaller end than what we bother with. So I just gave them a scrub in the bucket, a scrubbing brush, and that takes the scales off pretty easily. A lot of these fish, I think you could just get a coarse cloth and actually rub them and do the same job. We don't have a coarse cloth and we don't have a washing machine handy, so there we go. So basically, using a sharp knife, I've just been taking the sharp scoots off the side of the tail, because they're no good to eat. Girls like them. Gulls like them, and you do need a sharp knife for that actually. A cut behind the head and it runs down behind both the sets of fins, the pectoral and the ventral fins, okay, the ones that are on their belly. Ends up in, in behind there, cut up under the gut, a bit. pull it off and get everything out of there and then throw the head at the seagulls. Oh, the farthest away might have been more dominant. You've got to that stage, you fed the seagulls. Inside the um, stomach cavity is a bit of a black lining. If you scrape the knife lengthways along the fish on the inside, I find it comes out pretty good. Up in the spine you've got the blood line. You want to scrape that out. Because that, um, that, that helps the fish get rid of the waste products in its blood like our kidneys do. So don't leave that in there. On the other side. Cut bit of clean up. For those little mackerel, I don't suppose anyone's going to be like, uh, you know, ooing and ahhing over your trophy photos. But everywhere that we stop, you know, we can just quickly pick up a dozen of those. And it's just <laughs> so little effort. And it, they're really tasty little fish. Food. 
You eat half a dozen, you catch half a dozen. <laughs> Is that how many we had tonight? Yeah, we had three each. How do you feel? Do you feel... I'm not stuffed, because we had, you know, had those muscles, a pretty moderate sized meal. But we want to save these for the barbecue, right? Yeah, I'll make them tomorrow. So we're gonna try these Jack Mackerel tomorrow, smoked on the barbecue, but I'm just gonna give them a little sprinkling of salt. They've got a really pretty silvery bluey green shine. I think that's common with a lot of oily fish. Mm. That wasn't a heavy salting I just put on there. I probably put like half a teaspoon over each fish. And we're just going to pop them in the fridge overnight and then we'll smoke them tomorrow. But it should take some of the moisture out and just make them a little bit firmer, ready for smoking and add a bit more flavour too. Alright, it's the next morning. We've caught our jack mackerel. We're making some uh, water. The, uh, you can hear the water maker on in the background there. So we've got our, we've got our mackerel. They've salted overnight. And you can see that um, you know, a bit of liquid came off them. And we've got the heat beads. They've just gone grey. All the last bits of black are gone now. We've, we've heated them up. And I'm just soaking a few hickory wood chips. So we'll feed that onto the fire and then we'll load it, uh, we'll load those little guys on there. So they're looking pretty good. They've held their color um, and they feel quite firm this morning. So they'll just be a little bit salty and pretty soon they'll be a little bit smoky. Hurry up. So when we put those wood chips on, even though you know like we've wet them, they still burst into flames. But of course once we um, once we got those fish on there, then we can shut the lid down and it damps the amount of air going into them and they just smoke like crazy. Now if I look back there, we can see nice blue smoke coming off there. Amazing, what do you call that now? Call it salad. Oh, this is beautiful now. What do you call these things again? Rissoles. Everybody cooks rissoles, Dale. Yeah, yeah, but it's what you do with them. And what have you put on it? Dressing. Dressing. I did make the dressing myself. <laughs> Dijon, garlic, olive oil, Dijon mustard, a bit of honey, a bit of vinegar. That's it. Oh, and there's, so this is green cos, avocado, and some radish sprouts. Here's our fish, and it's got a really great golden colour to it. Um, so the first ones we smoked for about 10 minutes, and it cooked them through, but they were still really moist. So you wanted a bit more of a, like a firmer, drier. And smoke, yeah. Yeah, so we, we, we ended up um, putting them back in, and we did them for 40 minutes. And I actually loaded up with chips a couple of times just to really really smoke it. But that's, that's the result now. So it's dried it out a bit, and they're a bit firmer. And they smell really smoky now. You're making the boat smell really nice. So we've got smoked fish, but for scale salad, <laughs> and uh, we've got a we've got a pot of tea here. So it's just about everything you really need. So we have the professional verdict. Oh, that's good. <laughs> I had one of the ten minute ones, or I had a little bit of the ten minute one, but it wasn't smoky enough. It was really smoky. Here's Pasky definitely looking her best. I'm in my finest this evening. We're off to get some oysters. It's cold. 
don't need the exercise. <laughs> Stay warm. The oysters that we're going to grab here today are Pacific oysters and they were actually introduced into Tasmania in the 1930s and the 1940s from aquaculture facilities. So you're allowed to take as many as you want because, yeah, they're a pest species. So we're going to tuck in. Bit of an old engine part there. A bit of a boat. It's like a winch or something. Yeah. Yeah, be careful. You want your plastic shoes? Yep. Baby one. These are beautiful, but they're unwanted here. <laughs> mm. Happy to remove them. We are happy to do a good turn. <laughs> oh, okay. That's one for the bucket. It's a beauty. What are we going to do with these oysters there? I don't know. We've already got a really amazing haul. We broke our oyster knife, so we've just been taking them off the rocks and we're going to shuck them with our other oyster knife on the boat. Check it out. Some of these are massive. Look at that. That one is almost as big as my hand. <laughs> Don't tell anyone I got small hands. <laughs> that one's dead. That one ain't. Ah! Did you break it? You gonna eat it? Whoa! No, we can take that back. Yeah. Plump. <laughs> Joe's a very small rock. So with a yeah, with a bit of luck you can just go and find oysters that are <laughs> This one's I'm putting back. So I just mentioned before that we broke our oyster knife, but then we just found someone's dive knife in the rocks. So we're taking advantage of that. They don't look that attractive. Oh, seagulls. Getting excited. Woohoo! Don't cut yourself. No, well that's the, the usual way to do it. It's just in a tea towel, isn't it? Mm. Didn't bring a glove or anything. Amateurs. No, we never do. I normally wear gloves when we go oystering. Oh, yeah. yeah. Whoa! Oh my goodness. Whoa. <laughs> Look at that oyster. How's the serenity? Yeah, he loved the serenity of the place. How's the serenity? I think he also just loved the word. So much serenity. How's the serenity? Look there! No, it's not appropriate. We don't have an outboard running. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, look at those oysters in there. Look how plump they are. Is that myself? Yep. Yum. Oyster Supreme. Yum. Yum, 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 yum.
In our snug anchorage at Canoe Bay lies the remains of the steel hulled barge, the William Pitt. Built in 1907, she was originally a Dutch trading vessel called Andre Rabonicus. Renamed in Melbourne, she was sailed down to Tasmania to be used as a coal hulk and then in the 1940s to construct Hobart's floating pontoon bridge, the predecessor to the Tasman Bridge, which connects the eastern and western shores of Tasmania's capital city, Hobart. In 1955 she was scuttled to become a breakwater to provide shelter for small vessels in this bay, like our little Marul. We were curious to see what her underwater profile looked like after so many years submerged in this bay, so we donned our dive gear for an exploration. So even here, we're at about 40 degrees, 42 degrees south. Uh, you know, so it's pretty cool down here and we're in what's like bordering on a rainforest. But even still, you know, like once we got out of the wind and we start to walk, starting to warm up a bit. Have a look at Pascal there. My t-shirt. Everywhere we go in Tassie, it's just spectacular scenery. Just absolutely beautiful. Breakfast is easy. This morning Pascal heard a, a few thumps on the hull, so she just went out and caught about ten. Uh, ten, ten jack mackerel. Just straight away. That's uh, every time double hook up. <laughs> it looks it looks uh, it looks a little bit like jack mackerel are gonna be Uber Eats for Yachties. <laughs> Uber Eats for free rangers. Yeah. Yeah, I guess no other Yachties are eating. <laughs> The trees have their centers rotted. There's quite a few fallen ones. So I can see a few old widow makers, you know, like branches and even small trees hung up on other trees. So I'm sort of a little bit paranoid about it. But everywhere, everywhere a tree's fallen down here, they're just immediately <laughs> returning to the forest floor.
A little while ago there was some really major fires in New South Wales and the southern states of Australia and a lot of people wrote in and they were, you know, sent their sympathies and their best wishes. So thanks very much for that. If you have a look around at the base of these eucalypts, part of their strategy for survival is to, to make the bush around them really, really flammable because they're fire adapted trees. They can handle a, a medium intensity fire. So what they'll do is they'll drop a lot of leaves that have got a lot of that eucalyptus oil in it, which is really flammable. And these particular trees here, these blue gums, they drop a lot of stringy bark. So surrounding them, they make a real tinder pile. So what'll happen, a fire will come through here, sweep off their competition. You know, other plants would compete with them that can't handle fire. Um, but it also scarifies a lot of the Australian native seeds. You know, it prepares the seeds to, to germinate. So, before Europeans came, uh, Aboriginal people would go through and they'd fire the country, you know, they'd set it on fire and that made it, well, it made it possible to walk through, um, but it also stimulated new growth and brought kangaroo and other game into the area. Um, but it hasn't happened a lot now, so you get quite a bit of fuel accumulation, you know, if you don't get a fire go through there. And that's what we saw, like combined really, really hot temperatures and it was dry, big fuel accumulation and it really bombed off. But you know, just have a look around here and you can see that these eucalypts are, you know, it's not deliberate, you know, they're not thinking about it, but they're fire adapted and their adaptations um, are to make their environment more flammable. In it. Yeah, right. Rainwater Well, this is the view from the top. Well, actually, we came down two or three metres. <laughs> <laughs> but all of these walks, you know, they sort of end up pretty specky view, don't they, Pasky? They sure do. This is beautiful. I like that cliff over there. About two feet behind me is a sheer drop down to the water. <laughs> That's why I'm not standing there. It looks like good abalone country. Yeah, but it also looks like white shark country. White point of country. Ooh, a Pascal picnic. I'm gonna forage some chocolate. Found it on the tree. <laughs> right. This is my chocolate. Troy ate his before we left. Mm. <laughs> I'm a I'm a pretty shallow character. If you enjoyed our video at the stunning Fortescue Bay this week, thanks for hitting the like button and subscribing to our channel as it really helps get our videos out to a like-minded audience. Also, don't forget that my free 40-page provisioning guide is still available on our website. I've put a link on screen and in the description of the video if you haven't grabbed it yet. Bye for now and we look forward to seeing you next week.